This is the sound of turning ideas into software. This is the sound of engineering and passion. Work. Work more. Work harder. Experiment. Build. Break. And build again. Write code. Improve it. Job done. Celebrate. Insurance. Finance. Retail. Defense. Robotics. Energy. Amethyx. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. I'm Francesco, podcasting from the office of Amethyx Technologies based at the Beitnook in uh, Brussels, Central Belgium. And today I'm not alone. I'm actually very excited to have Conrad. And now you might be asking, who is Conrad? Well, Conrad is a, a principal data scientist. He will tell us where. But more importantly, Conrad is a Kaggle Grandmaster. Hi, Conrad. How are you doing today? Hey, Francesco. Good to be here. I'm, I'm doing quite all right. You know, spring is here, meaning the Dutch weather has become slightly less horrible, which is pretty much as optimistic as you can get in this country weather-wise before May. Let's be honest. The... <laughs> Yeah, I mean you're based true. in Belgium. You're based in Belgium, so it's not like it's a, it's so much better there. <laughs> exactly, I was saying just that. It's I, I'm in the same situation. Uh, so, uh, Conrad, uh, can you please explain to, I guess, the new kids in the room, uh, or you know, the new kids in general when it comes to data scientists, mm -hmm. uh, data science, uh, what is or what was Kaggle? And what does it mean to be a grandmaster of Kaggle? Uh, Kaggle is the place where data science grew, developed, and pretty much became a place where you, uh, well, you, you went to find out what's new, cool, and trendy, and works. Uh, on a minimally more serious note, Kaggle started as a competition platform where people will organize data science, con data science, con data science contests. I'm so sorry. Uh, coffee has worn off since the morning, and I'm trying to reduce my <laughs> consumption on that front. Um, no, my working theory is that in order to, you know, drink serious coffee after 4 p.m., you have to be either Italian or Turkish. It's, it's just a DNA thing, it. man. <laughs> it's it's a DNA Italian, thing. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm holding a cup of coffee and it's like, what, 5 p.m.? My point. PT? <laughs> thank you. My point exactly. You born anywhere north of Italy. You're like, nope, nope. Your DNA is not cut out for that. So um, as anyway, you can see, or as yeah. you can hear, the, the, the skills of the data scientists are still there <laughs> in your conclusions. <laughs> You do what you have to do, even with a small sample size. Um, so swimming to shore, that's how Kaggle started, but slowly grew mm, into a platform where people would store data sets, store, share, yada, yada, um, discuss, and also share code. Mm, being a grandmaster in, involves heavy recognition in one of the categories, competitions, uh, so sufficient number of high quality medals, uh, well, sharing data sets that are deemed valuable by the community, contributing to discussions, or sharing the kind of code that people appreciate. And nice, nice thing about Kaggle is that, uh, well, if there's a new mm, fancy topic, model class or something, uh, within a month, on the outside, assuming there's been a lot of holidays in between and people have been lazy, somebody's going to try and try and crash test it uh, in Kaggle competition to see if it's actually any good. Like, uh, well, strictly speaking, this is not a Kaggle example, but quite illustrative. There's a model called Lag Lama. And yes, someone intentionally called it Lama, probably to ride on the coattails of the LM uh, for time series. It's great. It's fantastic for my benefit of glorious progress. The only tiny problem is that in terms of performance, it's worse than exponential smoothing. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. While being some, uh, if if not the seasonal benchmark, because I, I I was only reading the comparative study diagonally on Twitter earlier today, it could be even even be the seasonal benchmark. So essentially. Uh, you strip away three zeros from the computational cost <laughs> and you still get better results. 
<laughs> All right. Well, we're going to cover a lot of topics today. And uh, indeed, we're going to also cover something about LLM because, as mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, the, the, new, the new trend here. And also, I would like to ask you later uh, what happened to, you know, the old good data science, but more on that in, in a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I want to ask you, actually, is uh, I guess it's time now or it's the right time to kind of disclose something about your winning strategy. Can you do it now about Kaggle? <laughs> we are late uh, enough. From... Yeah, there is no such thing as a winning strategy. There is no such thing as a universally winning strategy. There's the single biggest secret to it. Uh, I can't really say. I, I mean, it's not that I'm trying to be secretive, uh, but there is not. There, there is none. There is no such thing as a universal winning strategy. There's a bunch of things that you need to be it's like there's a bunch of dots, stuff you cannot be doing if you wanna if you wanna well have a serious shot at anything on, on cargo. Uh, but what you should be doing, it's it's very so wildly per person. I mean, I don't I'm not gonna turn my visit to your podcast into you know acting like an influencer on Twitter. No, no, no. I'm not going to go like that. <laughs> I appreciate nobody, your, your honesty. Nobody does. I think, I think even those people don't like themselves if they have a modicum of conscience. No, but that's, that's absolutely uh, acceptable as an answer. I mean, there is no winning strategy. There is just things that you have to do and things that you should not be doing depending yes. on this case. That's a... Uh, that's for sure. And uh, uh, maybe a lot of people back in the days where they were giving a lot of attention, I think it's still the case, uh, to feature engineering, for example, um, mm-hmm. which was kind of a key factor in uh, many Kaggle competitions, at least. So the possibility mm-hmm. to, let's say, transform the data in a way or extract some features that were kind of powerful enough to mm-hmm. be representative of that particular um, uh, data set or use case. Uh, do you have any favorite or most unconventional feature engineering technique that you want to share with us today? Not really. I've been always relying on on the idea that CPU time is, is cheaper than mine. So it was something like, uh, let's say I have numerical features and I'm dealing with something that sort of have, has a time component. So the simplest thing you can do, uh, you pick a bunch of summary statistics, say uh, minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation. And you can, of course, uh, explore it as much as you want. And you pick a bunch of time horizons, whatever. Say you have uh, daily data, 7, 15, 30, 90. That already gives you what? Four by four, 16 combinations. uh, And you just calculate a summary statistics, uh, a a rolling function like this for every combination. So you have a seven-day rolling mean, 15-day rolling mean, seven-day standard deviation, 15-day standard deviation, yada, yada. Uh, Mm. Pretty much how much time you got and how much memory is the only limiting factor because that thing grows like the factorial function. So you, yeah. Conceptually, it's the same thing. The workhorse is one function that performs one type of aggreg- aggregation or rolling over a given sized window. Uh, right. Beyond that, br- computational brute force. Right. So back in the days, in fact, a lot of people were doing exactly what you summarize, uh, I would say, very nicely here. Building features, indeed, feature engineering is just that, you know, engineering features uh, mm-hmm. and build whatever uh, is or might be related to uh, the outcome or the predictive value. Um, with the rise of deep learning, however, there has been some kind of a shift, you know, with respect to before we were building features ourselves or manually and with deep learning what happened is that we you know asked neural networks to actually wire themselves kind of Mm -hmm. and uh, build features for us Um, so my question is with the rise of deep learning how do you determine when to use let's say a traditional machine learning method versus deep learning approaches well if i'm dealing with large amounts of text or images 
then pretty much deep learning is is a no-brainer because traditional approaches just don't stand the chance for things like large-scale classification, for instance, or, ob or object detection, semantic segmentation, those kinds of things. Uh, audio, things like acoustic signals, mm, that's that varies a little. I mean, you can go both ways. You can treat it as a deep learning problem because you just, I mean, take a deep learning approach because you just look at spectrograms and then you, well, what's a spectrogram? It's an image. So you reduce the problem to an image problem or you can do the more feature engineering way. So take the ML spectrogram, those kinds of things and try to extract features from there. Essentially um, put the entire apparatus of signal processing to it. Uh, varies, varies quite substantially uh, in, in approach. Uh, so that can change. If it's time series, half a year ago, I would have said mostly classical things with an occasional sprinkling of deep learning, like LSTM models. But, but since then, people have started making... Uh, well, applying generative AI apparatus to time series. Because if you think about it, what's generative AI? You can say, okay, there's generative and then there's uh, discriminative approaches. So whether you model effectively the joint distribution or a conditional one for something you're trying to predict, or alternatively, you can say, what's generative AI or generative model? Well, it is a slightly weird form of zero shot forecasting. And the moment you think of, of generative as a zero shot forecasting, then all of a sudden the idea of applying time series, of using time series in that context, it actually starts to make sense. Uh, and then it puts um, time series and generating images based on a text prompt and a um, essay based on a text from whatever, a little bit more in the same universe. Uh, so that's, um, although that's something that's very much work, work in progress, as in I'm digging my way through it. Um, there's a couple of solutions. Well, there, there's the lag lama that I mentioned earlier, which is lovely, fantastic, great transformer. And it's also rubbish compared to, well, the almost deterministic benchmark. But there's also pretty cool stuff like the time GPT that Nixla dropped. Uh, so you know, it's it's history in the making. <laughs> it is. Indeed, I was asking uh, exactly that. Like, uh, you know, with large language models, we all know that they have gained immense popularity, uh, mm -hmm. especially recently in the last six months, six, eight months. Uh, my question is, how do you see large language models, for example, GPT-4, maybe 5, 6, whatever, uh, transforming uh, real-world applications, uh, particularly in data science and of course, if you can add on business contexts, because what I see is that there is a lot of people talking about, uh, you know, these new tools, uh, kind of the new elephant in the room, <laughs> but actually uh, a Kaggle master who has an opinion about these new approaches uh, would be very valuable, uh, in my opinion. So, Conrad, what do you think? For the very first time, Arctic Wolf, the industry leader in managed security operations, is offering you access to the most forward-thinking ideas from their most knowledgeable experts. Discover the top 2024 predictions developed by Arctic Wolf Labs, their team of elite security researchers, data scientists, and security engineers. Derived from the intelligence and insights gained from trillions of weekly observations within thousands of unique environments, these predictions trace the development of several trends based on their earlier, simpler iterations and anticipate which ones are poised to take significant steps forward in the coming months. Learn what the new year holds for ransomware as a service, Active Directory, artificial intelligence, and more when you download the 2024 Arctic Wolf Labs predictions report today at arcticwolf.com forward slash data science. That's arcticwolf.com forward slash data science. But you will also find the link in the show notes of this episode at datascienceathome.com. There's well, there's there is without a doubt 
multiple industries that are dinosaurs and uh, generative AI is the meteorite that's going to wipe them out. And personally, I couldn't be happier when I see, for instance, large parts of the adult, adult entertainment industry or in the or entertainment industry in general going extinct. Uh, because Hollywood has been throwing out regurgitated bollocks for as long as I can, for like, no, not as long as I can remember, that's too harsh, but ten, last 10 years? Like, like, ask yourself a question. When was the last time you've seen a movie out of Hollywood that was genuinely something original that you enjoyed watching and it was not a remake or a sequel? <laughs> Indeed, a Seriously, time, when, when's the last time? <laughs> Right? I'm I'm old, the corner. I'm old. So am I. So am I. <laughs> I mean, I am fully aware that a moment in time like the early 90s is not going to happen anytime soon if we've ever. It actually hit me a while back. Speaking of age, I turned 45 last year. In 1991. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> thank you, I guess. Or, or it's a polite way of saying condolences. But my point is... Uh, in 91, speaking of music, but I'm swimming to shore on the movies as well. Uh, there was a string of albums. Metallica's Black Album, Soundgarden Bad Motor Finger, Nirvana's Nevermind, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, the one before Blood Sugar Sex Magic, I can't remember the title, and I think it was Pearl Jam 10 or something like this. So like, boom, rock classic on classic on classic. And that came out with this in a span of like six weeks. Right. I mean, it's, it's bonkers. It's bonkers if you think about it. And I didn't realize it at the time because I was a teenager figuring out the whole music thing. So for me, that was just, I was like, that's just the way it works, the way the world works, right? That's, that, that's how it's yeah. supposed to be. Little did I know. Uh, same with movies. I was in high school. Uh, we had this program in our high school. Once a month, we would go the whole class to the movies and then have, you know, local small cinema, watch all the cool stuff, and then have a, like a big discussion afterwards. Yada, yada. And all, same thing, within like 12 months, I saw all of it in the theater live, okay? Because that was things that were in the movies. Pulp Fiction, Crow, Interview with a Vampire, Forrest Gump, Lion King, uh, <laughs> what else was there? Uh, Shawshank Redemption. I mean, oh, 12 wow. months! <laughs> See what I mean? This is gone. This is gone. Hollywood is like not, in the, not even close to that level of originality. But with the advent of generative AI, the entry barrier for some smart person out there, whatever, probably living in a city on the other side of the planet that I can't even name, let alone point to on the map, if they have a decent, decent GPU at home or access to a decent cluster, all they need is an idea. And all of a sudden, the cost of entry into creativity, huge, we, this technology scratches several zeros away. I mean, yes, coughing up something like 5,000. Okay, that's still not tip money, but it's doable. The, yeah, I absolutely uh, agree. And they call it democratization, in fact, you know. Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of, I'm a huge fan of yeah. that. It's like... It's like someone said in the context of the history of weapons development, God created man free and the guy who invented the crossbow made them equal. And that's more or less how it goes with Hollywood. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, don't you think that I want to be a bit critical with your assumptions mm -hmm. that, um, uh, you know, the entry barrier is low, lowered pretty much, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. as you said, and I agree with that. Don't you see the, um, let's say, the risk that, you know, this creativity actually becomes some kind of revisited or mix and match uh, version of something that was creative a while ago and it has been just, you know, blended into something else? Uh, it's, well, to a degree, I mean, is the risk there? Yes. Is this risk unique to generative AI? No. I mean, I'll give you my favorite example in, in movie history. If you look at 
what's arguably one of the greatest westerns of a, you know, oh, the spaghetti western. Who invented spaghetti western? Sergio Leone, the guy who went to the U.S., but he couldn't afford shooting in the U.S., <laughs> so he was shooting in Italy and in Spain, yeah? <laughs> His first claim on the word, on the word of cinema, the, the first thing that this guy whom Clint Eastwood called Yosemite Sam, that, oh my goodness, this is a serious player, that was Fistful of Dollars. What's Fistful yeah. of Dollars? Shot by shot remake of Joimbo. 1957, I think, movie by Akira Kurosawa. In Kurosawa's mm-hmm. movie, it's a Ronin who comes to a small town in feudal Japan, torn apart by, you know, clashing warlords, like yada, yada. The whole thing with the man with no name, this is Joimbo transported to the Wild West. But it goes a step further than that. Why did Kurosawa make a movie like this? Because when Kurosawa came to study filmmaking in the U.S. after the war, first, you know, batch of student exchanges, yada, yada, he was working as an assistant on a set of John Ford's movie, a living legend, the guy who practically invented Western as a genre. And he kind of took Kurosawa under his wing, showed him around, you know, let him watch stuff. And Kurosawa was so grateful he appreciated it so much that when he made his first bigger movie, when he came back to Japan, he wanted to make a Western just cast in Japan. Did he recycle what Ford did? And absolutely. Did Leone recycle what Kurosawa did? Absolutely. And yet no remotely same person would say that Kurosawa or Leone were ripoffs. They took something that right. was already there and they made it their own. So no. I mean, is the risk there? Yes, but it's always been there. It's always been there and a truly creative band. And I'm sure um, I still believe we have plenty of those, maybe more than ever with the lower barrier, can take, you know, the stuff that you thought you knew. You've seen a hundred times and they show you some, I mean, for crying out loud, there's only so many words in the language. And yet new and creative books keep showing up. So people figure out a way to say something else. No, I, I really, uh, I find your answer absolutely fascinating because, in, in fact, I mean, thank you for the analogy with the movies. I think this also <laughs> helps you. the non-technical people to grasp, in fact, the, you know, no, it's mm-hmm. a powerful analogy, I have to say, um, especially for the non-technical uh, listeners out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically your conclusion is uh, generative AI can copy so what? Mm-hmm. Human, humans can too, and, and nobody has been yes. complaining. Or if those who did, it, you know, they, they, they called it plagiarism, and, and then, you know, we have courts for that. So it's uh, a problem that well, we all know. I mean, plagiarism. Plagiarism, it's as someone said, plagiarism is if you are stealing from one source. If you're stealing from several, it's called creativity. <laughs> nice. I, th- I, I think it may have been Picasso who said something to that, something to that effect. I, I can't remember the exact line. But yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> pick, any, that, yeah. <laughs> pick, an, pick any artist you appreciate. I mean, I'm very much a music guy. So it's like, I don't know. I listen to, say, I don't know, Eric Clapton. I hear Robert Johnson. And yet nobody's going to say that Clapton is just a Robert Johnson knockoff. N- nobody's going to say that. Despite the fact, yes, of course you can hear Robert Johnson's heavy influence and you can know that little Eric growing up in wherever, Liverpool in bleak 1950s England (laughs) was playing those records dead. I mean, yeah, and I think it's more like in the nature of the human mind, the fact that we get totally. triggered by some signal, some smell, some flavor, some sound, mm-hmm. some something that, you know, helps our, uh, you know, brain connecting something, you know, finding mm-hmm. the connection, finding the spike. They say, oh, I've heard that thing. I saw that thing before. Or it's not exactly like that, but actually I like it. I like that thing and I like this too. You know, it's it's the human mind that works like that yeah. so i i agree with you it's you know it's the creativity it's the creative process of building things of creating mm-hmm. it, new things um 
Conrad, I would like to switch gear uh, a bit mm-hmm. more on the, let's say, uh, I, it's not the boring part. I mean, this was amazing already, but uh, <laughs> it's something that is extremely important, in my opinion, which is bias. Uh, and also for, uh, you know, people who deal with legislation and uh, uh, regulations of AI, regulation of AI, you know, bias and ethical considerations are, of course, you know, fundamental importance. Um, now, Back in the days, and you know, our Mm generation, we are of the same generation. I'm 42, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Now, controlling bias with, uh, let's say, the data science models we were used to some years Mm -hmm. ago was kind of, I'm not saying trivial, but it was something that you could keep under control if you Mm -hmm. knew what you were doing, right? even though I should say that many people really didn't bother about bias back in the days, but that's a different story. Now, with large language models today, uh, you know, these massive models can make the bias problem a lot more difficult to deal with. How do we approach that and what are your considerations? On a purely personal basis, Remove safety labels on everything and let natural selection take its course. For, for, for and I'll tell you exactly why. I'm not just I'm not just trying to be a you know edge lord wannabe. Yes, it's risky. Yes, it's going to get dangerous in parts. I I know, it's still a safer option compared to le- letting a bunch of people not accountable to anybody define what's truth. Right now, the people defining what constitutes truth, acceptable use, uh, bias, blah, 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 that's primarily the European Commission. I mean, those are those people aren't competent enough to run a public toilet at a train station. They don't have the IQ or integrity to do that. They are not competent. I mean, for crying out loud, in Italy recently, I mean, for the record, not that I'm picking on Italy specifically, okay? I don't want to. I don't want it to sound that way. But I just go ahead. This example: there, there is this former prime minister, oh, Giuliano Amato, I believe. Yeah. Bless his heart. Do this in his mid eighties, and he has been uh, put. No, good for him. He's apparently he's a, apparently a very very good shape. Uh, eighty plus. Eighty plus. Good I, for I, him. I think I I know where you're going. <laughs> And they put him in charge of a commission deciding on the algorithmic usages of AI with the greatest possible respect for Mr. Abato, of whom I know nothing, apart from the fact he's a former prime minister. He's 85. I'm sorry, nobody said the sharpest at 85. Yeah. Yeah. And this is very, very symptomatic of the EU. The fact that it's those people deciding on those matters is absurd. It's, It's just absurd. I mean, the guy in charge of the EU AI Act, Commissar Breton, Breton, however am I supposed to pronounce it? I don't speak French, so I don't know. He is saying, literally, this will make EU the most competitive continent. I mean, Darl, I'm, I'm like, listen, darling, I know you've been probably thinking about your political career in high school, but you maybe should have paid a bit more attention in geography class. EU is not a continent. Your delusions of grandeur notwithstanding, okay? <laughs> like EU, Europe, and its constituent countries in particular, starting with Italy, have been around for quite a bit longer than the European Union. And I think you can make a pretty solid case Italy as a country will be around long after EU, European Union, Union is gone. I think that's a pretty safe bet. And I don't do, <laughs> and, I, and I'm not a gambling man. Uh, yeah. So that's on a higher level in terms of biases. On a more practical level, what is bias? What is bias? I mean, people think, not think even, let's look at the problem of pornography, which is something that every country on the planet that has a civilized legal system has to decide that certain things constitute legit artistic expression involving nudity, and some things do not. Now, you pass any, uh, well, in certain parts of the co- country, at, the continent at least, a newsstand, it's pretty easy to constitute what constitutes pornography. It's like pretty certain, yeah, that's porn. Uh, 
the Sistine Chapel, despite involving significant amounts of nudity, does not constitute pornography. And if you think it does, you need psychiatric help. Okay, but while useful as a one-liner, this is not good enough for a legal definition. A legal definition in the lower, someone says, this guy is peddling porn. And then the court has to decide, is this porn or not? It has to be a clear, actionable definition enshrined in law. And it's tricky because depending on jurisdiction, even within Europe, let alone worldwide, certain things fall on different, the same thing can follow different sides of that porn, not porn line, depending on whether you are in, I don't know, South America, North America, Europe, or Asia. And, it's, and this is a very, very simple problem compared to the problem of defining bias. Yeah. So that's especially those, issue. especially in this case, of course, the line is not blurred at all, and in the, in many other cases, as bias, bias is involved, it can you know it's not as explicit as you you know as your example, of course. It's My point exactly. Subtle. My point mm -hmm. exactly. Like again, to use the same example as before, I use something like hustler. It's clearly porn. Sistine Chapel is not. Taking a picture of the of I don't know a street in Amsterdam, where I'm gonna see. Actually, Amsterdam is not a good example. Let's take something further north. Oslo, north of Norway. Oh, north of Norway. That's 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 a good one. I probably will not see a lot of black people there. It's a fact. It's a fact. You, you just don't see a lot of black people in the north of Norway. It, it, it's, an, it's an objective physical reality. This fact is not a proof of bias. If I generate a pic, if a model generates an image of far north without any of with hardly any or no, no black people whatsoever. On the other hand, if I run it 10 times, and that's an actual that's an, that's an experiment I did actually run in mid journey. Show me a picture of a doctor. Not, no extra qualifications. Just picture of a doctor in his office, blah, blah, something like this. Nine out of 10 cases, it's a white guy. White people are under 10% of the world's population. Men are half of that. Clearly, there's something off about the training set of that in the data. The, and the thing is, what, another thing that's important, distinguishing between, what would you call it, bias like this coming from ignorance or incompetence and one coming from malice. This clearly is not malice because the moment I made it specific, I said, I don't know, African female doctor or Asian dude doctor. Yes, that's what I got. So it's not like the model does not do certain things, but if I do not specify explicitly the gender and ethnicity, then it defaults to white men. Makes sense. That's an issue. But as before, the far north example, far north of Norway, no, that's not a bias. Again, if someone thinks this is racism, then that person needs help or at least uh, rendezvous with a dictionary. Uh, the doctor thingy is how do we how do we use a bunch of examples like this to draw an actual line that's an operational definition that a lawyer who almost by definition is non-technical, at least non-technical in a sense that I'm talking about in this conversation, sure. can, apply, can apply. If we don't have this definition, then having a law like this so sweeping in its powers with imprecise definition that's malleable depending on the context that's handing a monkey a machine gun or a, or a bunch of rabid monkeys and things that happen afterward i mean that's asking for trouble yeah uh very clear conrad uh, i think we should also cover a bit about explainability because mm -hmm. uh, back in the days and again i i apologize even though i i should not uh apologize about you know making this you know comparison with what we mm -hmm. had in the past and the new things 
the new this LLM new trends that is you know bringing this new wave in everything we do. So uh-huh. um, explainability. Now back in the days, nobody really cared of uh, of uh, exp- of having a model that they, they could explain. Uh, uh-huh. Even more so on on Kaggle, where you know the the big deal there was just winning the competition and having the Uh the smallest error, essentially. It was not like, you have to explain your model. So it would have been a black box or whatever decision tree, a massive decision tree, whatever. Uh, Uh You didn't need to explain it. Now, with deep learning model, in fact, it's not that you don't need to explain. It's just that you can't explain because these are black boxes. And now we have very big black boxes. So... What happens now? What happens to the people who are demanding data scientists and technical people to explain? You know, they want to enhance explainability. Is it like something that is technically feasible with uh, these billion parameter models? No, not really. Not really. And as a profession, I think we just need to uh, take a long, hard look in the mirror and say, how much do we really care? I mean, don't get me wrong. This is not uh, me positing that we should be depositaries of a sacred knowledge. You profane people don't deserve it. Far from it. Far from it. But let's be realistic. How much can you explain? I mean, I'm occasionally struggling in communications about explainability with about explainability with people on my technical level. And purely as a I mean, not as a value judgment, purely statistically, uh, that's a minority. Mm. Like, even the, that's problem number one. Problem number two, problem, challenge. Let's try to do a glass half full thing. That's what Americans say, like, optimism, great, yes? On the other hand, I'm Eastern European, so the hell can I do about my DNA? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's also the aspect, I mean, explainability. Like, how was classically a, a linear model explained? You would draw an equation and say, okay, if I fix all the variables except for this one, then the unit change in this variable corresponds to this change in, uh, in the other, yeah? To aid the target. Yeah, but where the hell in real life are you gonna have sensitive, everything fixed except for changes in one variable? I mean, it's a contrived example anyway. It gives you an illusion that you understand what's going on, but you don't really. You, you don't really. So that's one. On the other, I mean, the reason this is important, I think, is pretty much the same reason it's uh, important to reduce halus or to not, not reduce to get a grip on hallucinations in LLM. It's about, what would you call it? People critical applications. Meaning, if I can't explain why exactly is the model always giving me a beige Labrador when I'm generating uh, pictures, yeah, it's not a huge deal. If I'm creating a promotional campaign and it's always an Asian woman and never a black one or never a white one or whatever, yeah, it's a bit big of a bit, bit of a bigger deal. If it's a decision where we are making where we are predicting something in a whatever gaming site, nobody really cares. If it's about insurance or survivability of a cancer patient, we better be able to explain. If it's a triage type of situation. So when it matters is I think dependent on the context a lot. Yeah. I'm glad that these are all the things that we already thought back in the days and they still apply. So this is a, a nice lesson about doesn't really matter what is the new trend, what is the new kid in the room doing or the youngest kid in the room doing. Uh, you know, things that made sense like 10, 20 years ago, they still do. You know, data science after mm-hmm. all is, is a form of science. So we should be applying uh, the principles that are actually that were correct and still are, regardless mm-hmm. of the methodologies that you might be at hand. 
Connor, this was great. I have just one last question for you, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, of course, you know, speaking about the future, uh, what do you think are the emerging trends or areas of focus that you believe will shape the next big wave of challenges and opportunities when it comes to data science and artificial intelligence, of course? Uh, I believe there are two. One is the one is small language models, uh, where a lot of people have come to realize that you don't need, you know, but the budget, the size of OpenAI, and a model with gazillion parameters. If all you really care about is a specific domain, and the general performance of the model in other domains is not of not much importance to you, and we're starting to see the trends with smaller models, and also this combined with quantization and pruning methods, so you can start moving it closer to the edge, as in literally the edge computing on on devices. Uh, that's one thing, which, by the way, should have a nice byproduct of being more private and not flushing your data back and forth. With from God knows where, really. And the second trend, probably, I mean, I hope it will be a trend, is everyone's using the juxtaposition of closed versus open source, where OpenAI is closed and Llama is open, simplifying. But it's not really open, is it? Because you can't replicate it. You don't have the data. You have the code, but you don't have the data. So on the other hand, you have people like uh, what they call Olmo, who have released stuff that is open end to end. It's like DIY, here's a cookbook, here's the recipe, here are the components, good luck. <laughs> uh, I hope uh, this turns into a trend. I don't have an awful lot to substantiate that before my, beyond my wishful thinking, but I think it would be really nice. This is great. And uh, I would say that, uh, indeed, LLM is the past, SLM is the future. <laughs> small, mm -hmm. small language models. Maybe we just coined a new term. Who knows? We'll see. Time will tell. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, Conrad will uh, report as much as we can about you know the things that you mentioned, uh, like mm -hmm. Lama, TimeGPT, Olmo. We have amazing show notes where the listeners usually find them helpful also to mm -hmm. keep in mind and uh, uh, do some research do some homeworks expand your knowledge with the you know following always them. a good idea <laughs> always a good idea indeed uh conrad i thank you so much for being today with us my and, pleasure uh, <laughs> i wish you the best and uh, see you soon probably on cargo thank you <laughs> take care And if you made it until here, well, congratulations. You have just unlocked the master of data science achievement for surviving another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. It's free of charge. And you will find the link on the official website, datascienceathome.com. Till next time. <laughs>